Good evening. This is the third lecture, as I'm sure you know, and, and, and really what I want to look at here and ask questions around uh, is a solution. Uh, what can we do about gangs? Um, what do we mean, I suppose, is the question I need to ask at the beginning, by solving the gang problem? Because what we've seen is that the gang problem is part of, of a, a matrix of, in society. Uh, it means solving crime. Uh, if we're really talking about the gang problem, are we talking about solving crime? And if we're talking about solving crime, uh, that's a big task. Crime appears to be intrinsic to all human social systems. It's not particular to Cape Town, it's not particular to gangs. And in fact, in that, we're not alone. You know, we, um, primates, particularly the great apes, cheat, they lie, they steal food, they kill, they rape. Uh, we, you know, we're part of a, a noble uh, line of species that uh, appears to, to do that kind of thing. So um, if we want to solve crime, per se, and gangs along with solving crime, it means we're going to have to remake society to a different tune. Now, we've been dreaming that dream of remaking society through Socrates, Buddha, Jesus, Muhammad, Marx, Martin Luther King, Karl Popper, the whole lot are all about solving society, transforming society. Um, but what that involves is, is, is an ethical restructuring of corporates, of government, of transnational syndicates and systems. That's not what I'm going to do tonight because it also involves transforming us as a species. That can't be just part of the discussion. What I'm more interested in and, 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 and what I need to focus on is perhaps more useful in the end is to figure out how to solve violence and hopelessness among young people uh, who, who have no alternative. That's really the focus of what I want to look at this evening, because most members of gangs uh, in the city and elsewhere are young people. What do we know about gangs? Well, a bit of a recap. Um, they, they're an urban phenomenon, and their crowding is an issue. Uh, this is just a recap of, of what I said last night. They, they, they operate in particular kinds of urban structure. They, Relative poverty, not absolute poverty, mainly male dropout, school dropouts, identity images are issues. Their members tend to have uh, parental attachment problems. Uh, they might have mental and physical health problems, drugs, um, gangs, activity, and weapons and violence. So th those are the, you know, if we're going to change anything, those are, 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 are kind of areas that we need to start looking into to, to see what we can do about that. Um, but what we're really looking at, I guess, is what can we do to help young people live meaningful and resilient lives in environments that favor gangs, crime, and violence? That becomes the real focus here, because these kids are there. We can't do anything about those situations in the long term, or even in the medium or short term. So how do we, we help kids not be involved in that process? And, and to do that, we have to ask a question, which young people? Who are we talking about? Uh, do we target young people who are not yet in gangs? Because that's a whole area to get them not in gangs. In gangs, but whose delinquency is adolescence limited, if you remember, as opposed to youth uh, life course persistent. Uh, kids who are in gangs whose criminality uh, is longer term, or all of these, who, who are we targeting? And, we need to know um, the, those issues about um, life course persistent and, 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 and um, uh, adolescence limited. Now, you know, this is what we've been talking about this week. We, we're looking at the structure um, of the cities. We've been looking at the hierarchies and the gangs themselves. I'm just making it, you know, you were here yesterday, so you know what I was talking about. Um, those are just uh, memory prods. We must remember, I guess, that many youths, many kids are in gangs because it's the only, the, the only theater of adolescence that they have. 
It's the only possibilities of leadership. It's the only route to income. And I want, uh, sorry, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself, but we, we really need to focus on those three areas, what's happening in the cities, what's happening in neighborhoods, and what's happening to individuals. Sorry, I'm just going to flick fast through that. The, the, if we're looking at changing things, we need to look at um, the routes that kids take. And one of the things that, that programs have not taken into account is that um, if these kids are just adolescents causing trouble, um, we, we need to look at their environments and find out what it is. And usually, if it's adolescence limited, they still come from a supportive environment and they are resilient. The problem is the, the kids who come from the unsupportive environment and, and they really are at risk. What I want to talk about today is a rethink of a number of things. Just to flip through them, it's education, it's the family, it's policing and prisons, it's what we do about neighborhoods, it's actually personal resilience as well. And that's, that's, uh, that's a fascinating area, what, what builds resilience. And at the end, we'll just have a look at what policies uh, actually happen. Now, if I'm going to take education, South Africa spends a huge amount of money. We spend per capita nearly the same as France on education. We don't have the same outcomes as the French system in education, and we know that. And the questions we need to ask uh, is why. If you look at that graph, um, the, the, one, uh, the, the money spent is along the bottom, and the, 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 the outcome is along the top. Now, if you look at South Africa, it's spending a lot of money for very little outcome. It's much worse than Al Algeria, for instance. Um, it's much worse than Ecuador, Indonesia, Sri Lanka, Zambia, Senegal. Why uh, are we not getting it right with this high expenditure um, over there? And, and so what we're doing in this country is, is we, we're taking kids, they're not getting to where they should in education. They, 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 they're underachieving, and it's not their fault. They're the same as any kids anywhere in the world. Um, they're just not getting the kind of education system that's lifting them off. Is that possibly because the national curriculum is inappropriate? Are we teaching the right kind of things? If you look at the subjects that we teach, mostly they are uh, sort of the outcome of a Victorian slicing up of knowledge um, and, and, and that might not be appropriate for the, the kind of kids in this environment in, at this time uh, going forward. And what happens is that for many kids, and many of the, the young people I've, I've, I've talked to, they're just bored silly with school. They absolutely uh, don't want to be there. And it's, it's because for so many kids, the goals of, of education are framed um, around uh, Western neoliberal economies uh, to be, be, be sort of head uh, structured. And, and they, they're not appropriate to survival in a developing economy. So kids look at the education, they go, where am I going with this? And, and they realize that even if they're having a trick, the chance of getting a job, you know, there's 60% unemployment uh, when they, uh, of young people uh, uh, just who've left matric. So the kids who don't even get to matric haven't got a hope, so they drop out. And that's a, that's a, that's a big problem. They, they, they feel the skills they have are not valued. I am, am, am a product of that in a certain sense. I, I didn't like school much, and, um, but there was woodwork and there was metalwork. And I was one of the dorm kids. Uh, I, all my smart friends went and did Latin and all sorts of things, and they put me in the woodwork class. Well, that's why I stayed at school. It was fantastic. I went back to school every day because I was building something. I was making something. I felt good about it. Um, and I was good at it. Uh, I wasn't good at maths. I got an F for maths. Um, if, I, you know, if maths was to be an indicator of whether I should stay at school, I would have bailed out in standard eight, the flat standards in those days. So um, the, we, we need, I think, to look at the way in which we, we, we structure knowledge. And 
there, there are different ways. There, there, there are some kinds of tracks through school where, where you have what are called two-dimensional learning. It's very academic. It's neck-up learning. And we have what I call three-dimensional learning, which is practical, craft-based. And unfortunately, in the world, people who work with their hands are undervalued in comparison to people who work with their heads. They are not considered the same class of people. Well, that is about to change. It really is. You know, uh, people who work with their heads are end ending up in factories like that. They, they, the future of head work is almost factory work on computers. It, the, there's, a, there's a strong possibility it's going to look very boring. Um, the people who work with their hands, on the other hand, uh, their trade, I mean, you can offshore all of that stuff that I was showing you, you can, and it is being offshored. The people who work with their hands, the people who fix your car, the people who fix your sink, the people who build your houses, the, the people who build roads, are going to be the people whose crafts are not threatened in the future. And, and so I think, I mean, you can't hammer a nail or build a wall with the internet. So, so um, I think we, one of the, the things going forward is we have to revalue uh, hand intelligence. Uh, in, in, in the same way in which we value head intelligence. Otherwise, the education is going to peel off kids increasingly. Now, just to jump to, to the family and community, because that's another bracket we really need to look at. In terms of epigenetic development, the, the first thousand days, I cannot um, emphasize more, are absolutely crucial. You know, the, 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 the ability of kids to be resilient and to be intelligent and to be engaged takes place from conception for, for the next few years. And it's crucial to ensure that that, that period, for, for mothers particularly, um, is, is carefully looked at and, and worked with and, and, and supported. Loving attachment is essential for resilient children, and we have to put in systems that, that make that possible. You know, we used to have nurse visits in the city where every month, every pregnant woman, if she was at home, would be visited by a nurse. Now, that process, it's very difficult to know how to be pregnant. Uh, it's, it's not innate, it's not taught in schools. You don't know what to do, you don't know whether you should eat, you don't know whether you should uh, drink or not drink, take drugs or not drugs, and especially first time uh, 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 first birth. And, and that has been shown to, to bring down um, the, the later biosocial problems massively. In fact, part of um, Obama's uh, whole process uh, was, was nurse visits. He, he found them to be so important that his role, he, one of the last things in part of Obamacare is to roll out nurse visits across the, 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 the country. Uh, that came as a result of studies where they took two areas that were similar in socioeconomic background and had nurse visits in one and non-nurse visits in the other, and they tracked them. And, and the, 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 the violence levels in the non-nurse visit area was 50% higher uh, just because of that intervention. There might be other sort of variables, but that was the core uh, variable. So what we need to do is these things. We need to support pregnant mothers. This sounds odd talking about gangs, doesn't it? But these are key issues when we're looking at resilience among young people to prevent them being drawn into the gang system. Um, we need to do all of these things, and harsh discipline is another thing, and that's part of what, what people need to be taught. Um, and domestic violence and drug use is really bad for kids. So all of these things are part of a solution to gangs. And it, it, it causes a bit of puzzlement because uh, why am I talking about health issues in terms of gangs? I think what's important here is that connection was not uh, sufficiently understood. It, it hasn't until fairly recently been understood that, that um, that's important. And the other thing is that um, we have an early childhood development policy which has been developed by the HSRC, and it's going through discussion processes. 
And those first five or six years are absolutely crucial, absolutely crucial. Um, if you, all you, what you do there is you create a willingness and a love of learning new knowledge. And if you don't do it in those first five years, it doesn't stick afterwards. So um, quite a few people have said, if we can get that early child development stuff in place, we won't have an education problem because kids will know how to and love learning. And they will, even if it's a bad education system, they will take out of it what they need to, 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 to stay resilient. The next problem, and I really find it hard to work out what to do, is the problem of absent fathers. That's half of a cartoon, by the way. Have you finished reading it? You know, we, we have to teach young men responsibility in fathership. It's, it's, it should be, I don't know why, you know, one of the most important things <clears throat> that we do in life is to give new life life. We create life. And that's one of the things we don't actually teach people. We, we don't sufficiently teach them how to be mothers, how to be fathers, how to look after kids. That's supposed to look after itself. It's supposed to be innate. We need to do that without, expected to do that without much thought. The trouble is that, that, that we do need thought. Uh, it, when, when we moved out of small communities into cities, we lost that environment that supported the, the whole child process. And, and we, we, people are now in cities and we simply assume that people will know that stuff and they don't. They absolutely don't. The other thing is, is just briefly, the only way I can uh, depict it is, is, is the local economy is faltering. People, um, you know, pl places like Mannenberg probably have a 70% unemployment or underemployment rate. It's, it's, it's quite extraordinary. And unless we revitalize local communities, um, it's going to be very difficult to, to, to get an environment for kids to grow up. Now, of course, I'm jumping around, but, but you know, we're looking at the context within what solutions are. Um, I'm, my father was a policeman, um, and he was a, 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 a bobby. He, he never rose in ranks. He never had an education. He, I think he had a standard eight. Uh, and he used to, um, I grew up in a fairly small town, and I remember him almost all his life on a bicycle um, uh, patrolling the town. And everybody knew him, and he knew everybody, and they would call him in for array, an array of problems, which had nothing to do with normal policing, the domestic issues, money issues. I mean, he was the guy that you went to in the community if there was a problem. Um, and I never thought anything more of that was That was what police were. And when I started studying policemen uh, or, or policing, um, I was quite startled about how we've lost that. We've lost that, 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 that cop on the beat who you know and, and who you can trust and who you can go to. Quite the opposite seems to have happened. There's a whole lot of reasons for that. You know, apartheid didn't make for nice cops. They were expected to do unacceptable and brutal things that, that put them against the community. And that, that has persisted. Um, even now, when we don't have apartheid, we still have this suspicion of cops. And unfortunately, cops are fulfilling uh, that, 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 that stereotype. But in relation to gangs, they shouldn't be expected, and they shouldn't think that they can solve the gang problem. As I said earlier, there are all the problems I've been talking about, and, and then when there's a problem, you call in the police and expect them to solve the problem. There's not a hope in hell that they will manage to do that. Um, they can't do that. They can, they can tame it, things until it's solved by other departments. Um, I've talked to some really top-ranking police, and, and, and they say um, the failure of other systems is the crisis that we find ourselves in. 
We can't do it and they expect us to do it. People stand up in parliament and point a finger at the police and say, you've got to solve the problem. You've got to bring down the crime rate. The crime rate is the result of other things. The police are called in when all of that fails and they can't do it. But, you know, they're not very good at being good cops. That's the problem. The, 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 the top end of the policing system uh, is, is corrupt. I mean, you, you know, we've had uh, commissioners uh, who are criminals. And uh, I've, I've talked to bobbies on the beat, basically, guys on the ground. They say, well, look, you know, uh, these guys at the top are on the take. Why can't I have something out of it? What's in it for me? Where do I go with this? But what we have to do is re-educate police officers that are not good. We have to watch new recruits. We're picking up uh, uh, young people who, who are looking for a job but don't have any commitment to the profession. The, 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 the management system is not good. And the, the grievance procedures um, uh, are, are, are you know, a community who wants to report a problem in, in Lavender Hill. They're kind of scared to go to the police station. They get belittled, um, they get uh, hassled, and, and if they are reporting on corrupt police officers, they're not going to get a hearing. They're told to bugger off, actually. Um, and there's a whole merit issue that we, we really have to, to investigate. Another problem, of course, is, and I've, I've talked about it before, <clears throat> is that when kids go to prison, they end up in conditions that look like that. <clears throat> there's no way that prisons um, are, are are in any way useful. You know, uh, when, uh, when people were beheaded and hanged back uh, several centuries ago, they were put in rooms and held there until they could have public beheadings. That's what punishment was, or whipping. They were held till something happened, and then that, you know, that was the punishment. When there was an increasing public distaste, for that kind of um, uh, punishment increasingly across Europe. What happened is that the only thing left was the containment. Prisons are an actual mistake in terms of, I mean, it, it wasn't a mistake to, to do away with public hangings and beheadings, but, but in a sense they were an afterthought of punishment. So the only way you could make a punishment was to increase the, the length of your stay there. That, it's a time issue away from society in conditions like that. Now that is no way to change the, 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 the way in which young people go through prison. Prisons are a, a disaster. I don't know why we don't, haven't given more thought to it, but they, they, they entrench criminal behavior. You go to prison and you end up being a better criminal. They really damage people. They are, you know, especially with young people. Young people get into trouble for a whole lot of reasons, but including personal reasons. They're very confused, they, they are very angry, they are acting out stuff, and they go to prison. And there's a lot of other kids who are angry and acting out stuff, and you put them all together, and the result is a disaster. They get, wor they, you know, they get multiply worse. Um, and and a another thing that, that is, I discovered only recently is that if you have a criminal record, <clears throat> it sticks for 10 years, you are on a list somewhere. And if I want to employ this guy, I can phone up somebody in Pretoria and say, tell me about this guy, this is his ID number. And they'll say, oh, he got five years in Polsmore, and I don't employ him. So if you get a five-year sentence, it's a 15-year sentence, because you can't get a job for another 10 years unless somebody's kind enough to employ you after you've been to prison. So what's happening is there's uh, people who've, who've been in jail, they, they might uh, have, uh, have drugs, they might be a fight, violence, whatever it is. Um, an adolescent misdemeanor ensures that you have a life outside the regular job uh, uh, circuit. And, and the only thing that's waiting for you uh, is the gang system. So you kind of fall back into that. If prisons are going to be effective, and, and, I, and I say this to prison, I mean, I've given talks to, to prison officials, and, and they kind of all agree, but they don't do it. It's one of the most conservative uh, departments in government. 
they must heal the damage done by society. If, if we take people out of society and damage them more, that is ridiculous. Um, we, we need to, and the only way that you can make sense out of that is we, there have to be educational institutions. If prisons are not educational institutions, they should be abolished and we should think about something else. Um, but you know there are places in the world where, where they are uh, educational. Um, there's just a, 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 in parenthesis, in the late 19th century, there was a governor, um, I can't remember his name, who said exactly what I'm saying now. We've got all these people in prison, but we've got to teach them stuff. And um, they were taught building and stone masonry. Stone masonry. Is that what you say? They were stone masons. <laughs> and much of Cape Town built during that period was built by them. They were very highly skilled stonemasons. And another governor came in and said, that's rubbish. These people are criminals. And that was the end of that. There was a brief experiment in Cape Town um, where the prisons created an artisanal class of people, um, highly skilled too. We could do it. We know how to do it. Another problem is that... As a society, um, we've lost the neighborhood in many areas. It's not governed by the country anymore. It's governed by drug lords. And uh, you can't go in without their permission. They, are, they take um, uh, money to, th th they charge you for the air you breathe virtually. Anything you do has to go through them. And, and the, the problem is that nothing gets going because of, of, of this, this, this kind of economy. And the problem is there that if you live in conditions like this, it's, it's very difficult to work out what a community is. It's a survival process. I, got, I found a lot of old pictures of District 6. Um, I, I thought some, some paintings were, were actually more appropriate. That, had a sense of community, which we've talked about. Um, I even found a picture of the Globe Gang, which is the terror of District 6. These were gentlemen, you know, they were middle class guys. And when you get down to it, they were a vigilante group, really, rather. They were, they were, they were controlling crime more than they were being criminals. Uh, things have changed markedly. And, and so now the areas are not conducive to community involvement. They, they're not easy places to do anything in. Now, another thing and, uh, that, that is obvious that we have to do is we need to understand that there's a huge drug problem, but in order to do something about that, we need to understand why people take drugs. And I found a really interesting little video um, that I'm going to show you that, that answers that quite interestingly. Let me just see if I can do the, the switching here. Be very smart if I can. Ah, oh, does that look possible? Yeah, no, no. I might, I might have to call for help because it's not supposed to look like this, and the man's gone. Um, why is it? The, the video? That thing there? Okay, here we, ah, somebody said the right thing. What causes, say, heroin addiction? This is a really stupid question, right? It's obvious, we all know it. Heroin causes heroin addiction. Here's how it works. If you use heroin for 20 days, by day 21, your body would physically crave the drug ferociously because there are chemical hooks in the drug. That's what addiction means. But there's a catch. Almost everything we think we know about addiction is wrong. If you, for example, break your hip, you'll be taken to a hospital and you'll be given loads of diamorphine for weeks or even months. <coughs> diamorphine is heroin. It's in fact much stronger heroin than any addict can get on the street because it's not contaminated by all the stuff drug dealers dilute it with. 
There are people near you being given loads of deluxe heroin in hospitals right now. So at least some of them should become addicts. But this has been closely studied. It doesn't happen. Your grandmother wasn't turned into a junkie by her hip replacement. Why is that? Our current theory of addiction comes in part from a series of experiments that were carried out earlier in the 20th century. The experiment is simple. You take a rat and put it in a cage with two water bottles. One is just water, the other is water laced with heroin or cocaine. Almost every time you run this experiment, the rat will become obsessed with the drugged water and keep coming back for more and more until it kills itself. But in the 1970s, Bruce Alexander, a professor of psychology, noticed something odd about this experiment. The rat is put in the cage all alone. It has nothing to do but take the drugs. What would happen, he wondered, if we tried this differently? So he built Rat Park, which is basically heaven for rats. It's a lush cage where the rats would have colored balls, tunnels to scamper down, plenty of friends to play with, and they could have loads of sex. Everything a rat about town could want. And they would have the drugged water and the normal water bottles. But here's the fascinating thing. In Rat Park, rats hardly ever use the drugged water. None of them ever use it compulsively. None of them ever overdose. But maybe this is a quirk of rats, right? Well, helpfully, there was a human experiment along the same lines, the Vietnam War. 20% of American troops in Vietnam were using a lot of heroin. People back home were really panicked because they thought there would be hundreds of thousands of junkies on the streets of the United States when the war was over. But a study followed the soldiers home and found something striking. They didn't go to rehab. They didn't even go into withdrawal. 95% of them just stopped after they got home. If you believe the old theory of addiction, that makes no sense. But if you believe Professor Alexander's theory, it makes perfect sense. Because if you're put into a horrific jungle in a foreign country where you don't want to be, and you could be forced to kill or die at any moment, doing heroin is a great way to spend your time. But if you go back to your nice home with your friends and your family, it's the equivalent of being taken out of that first cage and put into a human rat park. It's not the chemicals, it's your cage. We need to think about addiction differently. Human beings have an innate need to bond and connect. When we are happy and healthy, we will bond with the people around us. But when we can't, because we're traumatized, isolated or beaten down by life, we will bond with something that gives us some sense of relief. It might be endlessly checking a smartphone, it might be pornography, video games, Reddit, gambling, or it might be cocaine. But we will bond with something because that is our human nature. The path out of unhealthy bonds is to form healthy bonds, to be connected to people you want to be present with. Addiction is just one symptom of the crisis of disconnection that's happening all around us. We all feel it. Since the 1950s, the average number of close friends an American has has been steadily declining. At the same time, the amount of floor space in their homes has been steadily increasing. To choose floor space over friends, to choose stuff over connection. The war on drugs we've been fighting for almost a century now has made everything worse. Instead of helping people heal and getting their life together, we have cast them out from society. We have made it harder for them to get jobs and become stable. We take benefits and support away from them if we catch them with drugs. We throw them in prison cells, which are literally cages. We put people who are not well in a situation that makes them feel worse and hate them for not recovering. For too long, we've talked only about individual recovery from addiction. But we need now to talk about social recovery, because something has gone wrong with us as a group. We have to build a society that looks a lot more like Rat Park and a lot less like those isolated cages. We are going to have to change the unnatural way we live and rediscover each other. The opposite of addiction is not sobriety. The opposite of addiction is connection. This video is a collaboration with Johan Hari, the author of the book Chasing the Scream, The First and Last Days of the War on Drugs. He was very kind to work with us on this video to spread the word. We recommend that you give the book a try. Our videos are made thanks to your support on Patreon.com. If you want to help us make more of them, we really appreciate your Let me get rid support. of that. <laughs> That's good, hey? I mean, it's really interesting. Now, now to see if I can get back to that. Okay. Johan Hari um, 
was involved, he's a Dutch guy, was involved with, with uh, uh, drugs and addiction. And he watched a number of his friends die and he decided to do an investigation of the war on drugs. Um, and the deeper he got into it, the more horrified he became. Uh, it's a really interesting book if, you, if you're interested in the drug issue. Um, and here's the guy with the, the, the right injection. You see, you just arrive and it happens. Isn't that amazing? That's, that's a man of spirit. <laughs> Thanks a lot. That video is an indication of um, the drugs, and it's, you know, it's a sort of slightly more academic thing. But I was looking around at the problem of drugs, and I came up with uh, the idea that we really ought to, I don't think we should legalize drugs. Because that's a problem. I think we should legalize cannabis because, I mean, it's, you know, it's everywhere in Africa and has been for thousands of years. But decriminalizing drugs is a really interesting issue. And, and what I discovered was Portugal. Uh, in 2002, Portugal um, uh, decriminalized all drugs. There was a huge hue and cry in, in the EU because everybody said, you're going to be the new drug center. Forget about uh, Holland. You, you, drugs are going to be everywhere. Um, absolutely the opposite happened. And the reason it happened, and now, I mean, if you are caught with over 10 days of any drug in, in Portugal, they will take you not to the police station, but to a center. And people will uh, sit you down and say, what is the reason and the problems in your life that make you need to take drugs? And the reason why it's working is that the, the, the Portuguese authorities who, who brought this in discovered that the reason ta people take drugs largely is sadness. The sad, what this video was actually showing is that that disconnectedness, that sadness, was causing people to search for a chemical hug. Um, and and the, uh, the Portuguese example um, is starting to be seriously considered all over the world. And I think that that, I don't know whether, there have been moves in South Africa to decriminalize cannabis. Um, I think that we will eventually look back and be horrified that we thought we could solve the problem by having a war on drugs. It's just not possible. Those are personal issues between you and, and, uh, and, and, the, and the drug. I don't think taking drugs is a good idea. I think taking all drugs, you know, it, it takes you to the wrong place. You don't get addicted, though, even with hard drugs on the first drug, uh, first take, or the first hit of that thing, uh, as the video shows. And I think we should, this country, we're going to have to, we should be ahead um, of the field and start thinking about decriminalizing drugs. I want to just look at two things now briefly before we head down and have a chat about all of this and some questions, is um, if we decriminalize drugs, what we do is we collapse the illegal syndicates. And it's in the interests of syndicates to get people addicted. Obviously, if you're addicted, you're locked into the syndicate. Um, If we do that, if we decriminalize, we're going to stop the turf wars largely of the merchant gangs. Those, those wars are entirely about selling spaces. If that disappears, the turf wars will disappear, we'll collapse the drug syndicates, we'll disincentivize international drug trade. We, Where would we get to Sorry? In uh, decriminalizing drugs doesn't mean you serve them up in a shop. Uh, legalizing drugs does. And the places like, there are quite a number of uh, countries in South America that uh, have legalized uh, cannabis, and, you, and, and in, in uh, states in, in the United States as well, where they actually have shops where they sell the stuff the same way that you go and buy alcohol from a shop or cigarettes or any of those things. Um, Decriminalization doesn't approve of the sale of these things, but it's, it's the way in which it's approached. Instead of criminalizing users, it's uh, involved in harm reduction as a result of, of drugs. 
So it's, it takes people, it doesn't say drugs are a good thing, it doesn't say you should sell them, uh, but if people happen to buy them however they do that, um, it, it, will, it will move them in a harm reduction direction. And, and, and that in Portugal has definitely shown that, that it doesn't make it very valuable and useful to the, the syndicates because fewer and fewer people take drugs because they're getting support uh, in, in the reasons why they take drugs. That's, that was the, the, the Portuguese uh, findings. Now, one thing we need to do is that the drug lords run many of the areas. And we, we really need to, to claim those areas from the drug lords, and we can do that. The last thing I want to talk about is, and I'm jumping around a bit, is personal resilience. What do we mean by resilience? I, um, it, it's really, it, it goes to a personal thing rather than what other things cause kids to do so that they end up in gangs. It's something innate within these kids that we have to build uh, that, that makes them less susceptible to this process. And it's, it's having competencies in spite of high-risk context. And many, many kids do, of course. They don't have to join gangs. They, um, the, but the trouble is with gangs that they, they get into gangs for affirmation, for ritual, for acceptance, and all of these things. And they need refathering, refamilying, reattachment. And all of these things, if we provide those, um, is it possible that they would rather go there than with gangs? And yes, the, the answer is, is, is that, that that is so. We, uh, I started with a couple of other people, um, an organization called USICO. Um, and that, and it's, 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 it was running for 15 years. And what we did is we built uh, a set of rituals, quite strong and stressful rituals actually, that emulated what the kids were looking for in gangs. And this was uh, related to wilderness. We'd take these kids uh, into the wilderness. We'd go through rituals with them. Not religious rituals, just sort of actually very ancient rituals. And it included solo, where they, for a couple of nights they would have a sleeping bag and water and be in the wilds, and, and that was it. They had to hang out there alone. And when they came back, when they come back, they're heroes and everybody, there's a circle of acceptance and all of these things. So um, boys and girls, and these have been incredibly successful. In fact, now they are used uh, pretty extensively by the Christmas Academy. And in the, the assessments of the three months that the young people go to Chrysalis, they hold that process as, as the most powerful and important uh, part of, of their time there. And the program that we built is built entirely around the gang system. And it, it starts like this. It starts with the fact that uh, the young person hits a wall that they can't climb over. There's a problem, there's a crisis, they, 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 they're scared, or, or, or there's an issue they can't deal with. What happens then is you link them to a, a significant adult, a mentor, basically. And then there's this ritualized process they go through. There's acceptance by peers. Um, there's a time of reflection, which is the wilderness. And there's this very strange thing that, that, that I've just started studying fairly recently, which I, I suppose for want of a better word, we call epiphany, where they get it. There's something, you know, there, there's, a, there's a sudden strengthening of something that, um, that happens. One of the best trainers, uh, a guy called Lerata Kossi, who I've been working with for quite a few years, uh, was a kid who went to prison from, uh, from Kai Lecha. He, he got into trouble. He ended up in prison. He was in a gang. And he finally he, he got out, and he wanted to go back to school, but he was a little bit older, and he had a lot of trouble getting back into school. And finally, a principal said, look, I'll take you, but any trouble, you're out. And he went back to school, and uh, the biology teacher was um, going to have an away. They're going to take the kids into the countryside. And he didn't want to go. Who goes to the countryside? He was you know, from Kailich and what the heck. Who's, 
Anyway, the teachers obviously saw something in him and said, look, you have to come, and, and, and if, if you need transport money, here it is, and he went. And he tells me the story. He said he was sitting on Table Mountain. Uh, there was a stream, and uh, he, he saw a frog on a rock. And, and he realized that he didn't know what it was. He didn't really know what it was. He'd never seen a frog before. Then he realized he didn't know where the water was coming from. And, and he didn't know what those trees were. And he didn't know anything. He suddenly had this, I don't know what the hell is going on around me anywhere. And he had this it, a kind of a blowout. Um, and he, uh, became, he's become the, probably one of the finest wilderness teachers in the country. Um, he just hooked into, he sort of went through this tunnel into nature um, and never came back. Uh, and he, he trains many, many people in, in this process of transition and, and epiphany. So it's possible. That's what the, 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 the program system looks like. Now, just before we go there, I want to tell you a story, and, and it's really about epiphany. There, there was a a young guy at Chrysalis, uh, I think his name was Zaid Muhammad, if I remember, and, and he was a very troubled young man. Um, and he, he went, he was going to leave. He wanted to go and see Lucille May, who's a CEO, um, and he, he made the meeting, and, and she knew that that was probably what he was coming to talk about. But before, and she had a desk lamp, and she put a whole lot of um, uh, dish towels over it. Um, and when he came in, she, she pointed at this and said, um, she, she's amazing this way, uh, Lucille. She said, what's that? Uh, so he said, it's, 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 it's a lamp. She said, can you see anything? He said, no, 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 I can't. She said, well, that's you. Um, and, and what's the problem? He said, well, there's something over the lamp. And she said, that's also you take those things off the lamp. And there were about five things. And he started peeling the, these off. And as he took the last one off, um, she said, what do you see? And he got it. He just, he kind of jumped up and round. He, he wouldn't stop talking. He, he went nuts. He completely crazy with happiness. Um, and, and Zaid is now uh, one of the, the trainers uh, at Chrysalis. He, he trains other people in this process. So it's a very mysterious process, but it is possible uh, to take kids through a path to another space. It's not a religious process. It's really a psychological process. And um, there are an, um, a few people in the psychology department who are now actually doing their, their PhD on um, um, epiphany and transformation with young people. So. Those are a few things, really, that, that are part of the solutions. They are not the hit them with the cops. They are not jail people, to, uh, put people in jail, take them through the courts. That is not a route that's going to solve gangs. We, we need, I think, to have much more compassion for young people in this city. Uh, and only from that point can we start to work towards changing the environment which leads kids into high-risk behavior. Finally, um, this is not just pie in the sky. It, it, is, it is being embedded in, in policy process. Uh, you've seen this, this slide before. Um, this is, these are the processes that are now going through um, the Department of Community Safety. Um, they are attempting to, to, to look at appropriate life trajectories and paths, and how do we build those things? How do we create resilience? Um, the, I think I mentioned before, there's a national anti-gangstrom strategy, which is absolute bullshit. Um, uh, uh, somebody sat in an office in Pretoria and wrote it. Um, so we are trying to re rewrite it, basically, from scratch. Um, and what we're doing is we're engaging with people on the ground, we, 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 a whole range of people, because actually, at the end of the day, people on the ground know best what to do, not people who sit in offices. Um, we really need to talk to all those people out there that, that, that deal with young people all the time um, and create planning systems around that. Um, I mean, it looks like bureaucracy, but this is a consultative process that's sort of expanding, um, defining the focus areas that we need to work with, um, all these, these, these various areas, uh, with gangs as the central focus. But, but when we say gangs, we're really talking about high-risk uh, young people in the city, uh, in the Western Cape, actually. 
Um, and we're inviting people in to, to be part of the stakeholders who understand this kind of stuff. And it, it gets more and more and more and more complicated as we go. I don't expect you to read all that, but the, 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 you've, got to, you've got to do very pretty pictures to get bureaucrats to understand what you're talking about. Um, and, and pictures I've discovered are much better than anything else. They, they, they get it, all right, after a, a while. Sorry? Uh, sorry, uh, you're going to have to shout a little louder. Where did you get the pictures? Oh, from me. I mean, I made them. Which, the photographs or that structure? That, that stuff that we develop as we work. I mean, I'm, I suppose, a consultant into the process, and I put these things together as a result of 45 years of working with gangs and then, you know, turn them into pictures. If that, if, is that an answer that, that, I mean, does that work? <laughs> um, and, and what I find very often is that people don't document what they do, so everybody keeps reinventing the wheel. They, they, uh, five years' time, they go, we've got to do something about gangs, and then they start all over again. Um, so uh, one, that's one of the big problems of, of, of government. government. They, don't, they don't sufficiently document, and they don't hold that knowledge and, and roll it forward. And one of the biggest problems I've found working with government structures is that everything's in silos. These guys should be working laterally, but they work vertically, and then they don't talk to anybody else. So these are just little gripes I have along the way. Um, and, and you were drawing up an action plan, and you've seen this before. The action plan is sort of based on, on this structure that, that I showed you, I think, in the first talk. Um, uh, you know, it, it's too much to read for a screen, and I do apologize, but I just, you know, you can read the left-hand column uh, these are the areas that we're looking into, and we're trying to find solutions to, to those various issues. It's going to be a long process, but I think, you know, for young people, it's, it's, it's definitely worth it. It really is worth it. And, uh, you know, one of the problems with, with, with gangs is that they are boo words, um, and, and uh, the, we, we think that we live in a high-risk area, and the people who sell us electric fences and high walls and things with spikes on the top and alarms and systems amplify that. It's their market strategy to tell you how dangerous the city is. Um, and it's actually less dangerous than you imagine. It's very dangerous if you live in Yanga or, or, or Manenberg. It's, it's, it is a high-risk area, but most people um, probably sitting in this room don't live in those high-risk areas. And as a result of the work I do, I walk around the city at night, um, and so does my wife, quite happily. And we've been doing this for years and years, and we've never had a problem. Every now and then, of course, there are incidences, but um, it's no different to walking around London, Paris. You know, it, 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 it's that kind of level of problem. Um, and just to leave you with this, you know, we as a society have created the conditions that make gang formation almost inevitable, and, and that's really the message I've, I've been trying to get across here in the, in the last three days. Um, it's not them that are the problem. In a sense, it's us. We've created the situation, and we're condemning these people for, for, for reacting in a particular way and responding in a certain way. And, and really, as a society, we, we, it's up to us to, to change that. So that's really me for, 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 the, for, for, for gangs. I just want a, a brief commercial break. Um, uh, that <laughs> I wrote that book to try and solve these problems, and a third of it is about solutions. Um, and I noticed that the bookshop's not open at nice, night, so I, I do sell them for 200 rand if you <laughs> want them. Uh, OK, any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yo. So I'd like to know, you talk about we, and as if you're in a specific program, could you tell us more about that? The we, when I'm talking about this, the final solutions. Um, the Department of Community Safety has formed a group uh, of consultancy processes to start developing a gang strategy. That's the we. Uh, but I, I have lots of we's. I mean, I, I'm also a trustee of the Chrysalis Academy, and that's another we. And I also run the Yusiko 
trust, which is another we. So, I mean, the older you get, the more hats you end up with, I guess. Sorry, yeah. Yeah. Gangs change all the time. They're, 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 we have many, many more kids in gangs now than we did when I started. We have girls in gangs, which there weren't really any when I started. Um, the first book I wrote was called The Brotherhoods, and I ended up saying, if we don't do something about it now, and that was in 1984, we're going to have a bigger problem. I wrote another book 10 years later called Gangs, Rituals, and Rites of Passage, in which I said, because we didn't do anything 10 years later, there's more problems. This book says exactly the same yet again. We are not dealing with the problem sufficiently, and so the problem is growing. They will if we, I mean, uh, you know, the gang process in Portugal has reduced massively because it was all around drugs. But there are other hands up. Sorry. Um, yeah, OK. As long as it's not too long, because we got three minutes and a few more questions. <laughs> You've been put on the spot. I'll try to be brief as far as I can. Uh, basically, we have a museum. It's built in a container in a Kailiji, in the heart of a Kailiji. So basically, what we have there is, is, is we, have, we teach young kids about, about the consequences of, of training to gangs. Um, we have built a, we have recreated a prison cell within the museum itself, and also we have a uh, we have a, 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 a place where we show choices um, what is them to any gang and what choices they can take so that they don't go into gangs. And the whole museum is, 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 is the whole tour of the museum is run by the gangsters. So it's, it's more authentic and the kids learn more from, from the legal gangsters and then they understand what happens in gangs way better. And then what happened for the past three months that we've been working on that is that we've seen a lot of, a lot of young kids actually coming to the museum just to hang out of the museum and, and, talk, and engage with the guys that work and this, and then they start starting to like be part of that. Like, now we thought it was just, just going to be a museum, but now it feels like we have actually built a community within that museum as well. That's fantastic. That re really well done. Well done. Well done. Let me start unpicking this. Uh, any, any other questions? Yeah. Yo, at the back. Uh, just, uh, you know, I'm old enough to be hard of hearing. Say that a bit louder. How do you infiltrate the gangs? How do I infiltrate the gangs? Oh, it wasn't an infiltration. You know, I started by buying their drugs just to get in. Um, and then I made friends with them, and they took me to the next gang, and eventually I was part of the mongrels gang because I liked the leader, and he liked me. And he was very honored that, that, that the, somebody from the university was studying him. Um, and one thing leads to another, and I guess uh, the, the other part of the answer to that is taking them seriously, uh, really being interested in them. That's the best way to get into gangs. Uh, these guys are quite proud of what they do. Um, I know quite a lot about them. And a, and a curious